for joining me again today. Um, so today, hi. Um, so today we're going to tap into a different kind of oolong. Um, the name of the tea is called Da Hong Pao. Um, so you can find this tea from your uh, brewing kit, or sorry, for your crash course kit. And you notice when we read the package, uh, you notice so this is the Chinese character for the tea, and over here you have the name of the tea in Pinyin, or you can consider that as in English. And on the bottom here is a uh, different series of the tea the tea drunk offers. It's called the Tea Drunk Every Day. Uh, I highly, highly recommend this tea because it's at such a beautiful price point. Uh, like the name suggests, it's really good for you to enjoy on a daily basis. And uh, we're going to enjoy this together to see how awesome it is. Um, this is the location, which says Uyi Shan. Yeah. Uh, some other teas you might find two parts for the location. Uh, the first part is referring to the village, and the second part is the origin that the tea can bear certain um, uh, credentials. So. Uh, so it's a greater area, but it's the uh, uh, the limit of uh, the tea basically has to come within this area in order to be called that tea. So for example, this tea is called Wu Yi Yan Cha, and that means the tea basically needs to be come from Wu Yi Shan, which is indicated here in order to be called that. Um, and then here's the vintage, which is spring 2019. All right, we are use, going to use uh, Gai Wan and the strainer. Uh, and the fairness picture again today. So uh, make sure your water is boiling. And have a piece of a uh, Caesar ready. I'm gonna open my guy one. Uh, again, you can just uh, disband here. You can either use your hand or use the scissors, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna use my hand just because I was already there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then you can cut around it. And now we're going to uh, pour the tea into the gallon. So uh, yesterday, the oolong that we had, uh, I was mentioning uh, it was a dance home, right? And it, or Phoenix oolong, and it was heavily fermented and mediumly roasted. This is a style of oolong that is heavily uh, roasted and mediumly fermented. Um, so you'll notice a very a, a big difference in the. Uh, not only just in the aroma, which the, means this one is going to be so much more roastier, but also you notice there's a difference in um, uh, its fruitiness. There's a difference in the body, the texture as well. Okay. All right, so I'm going to pour the water around the guy one. Cover. Don't forget the stringer. Brush it open. All right. So remember, the first brew is just to wake up the tea. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> the colder the water, uh, the more satisfying this tea is. It just has so much warmth in uh, because the tea is roasted. And uh, this is also a tea. If you have a coffee drinking friend that you've been trying to convert into tea drinking, uh, this might be a good tea to start because uh, at least the roastiness can uh, uh, bring something familiar to a coffee drinker. Um, so the first brew is just to wake up the tea leaves, but remember, if it's the first time to uh, evaluate or examine a tea, you do want to have the first brew just to see how clean everything is. Uh, and then we can give the rest to the tea pet. Alright. Cheers. Mm. So there's a floral sweetness to the taste. Uh, it definitely has a lot of aroma. Um, you probably notice that there is a uh, uh, kind of like a woodsy feeling of the tannins, but it's not uh, similar to the tannins in wine, which we definitely saw uh, more pronounced in the um, dance hall or phoenix noodle that we had yesterday. So I was just having the first brew of uh, this. Uh, sorry, this is actually not the first brew. This is the rinse of the cliff tea or yan cha, um, and notice the lack of, of depth. This 
this brew currently has. And remember, we're utilizing uh, the opportunity of having to try multiple brews this close together in terms of time uh, to be able to distinguish or train our palate what is aroma, what is taste, and then the development of the texture of the body, and then also uh, focus our mind on the aftertaste. Right. I'm going to uh, immediately uh, uh, make sure the water is boiled again, and then I'm going to brew the second brew. Has any? But everybody got a, uh, are able to prepare and then uh, get the first brew ready. Okay. Uh, the first brew of club tea is very pleasant. A lot of times people will also save it, and as it cools down, uh, it'll also congeal sometimes become very gooey but it definitely lack of depth uh, so i was just gonna brew the actual first brew for the cliff tea All right so uh make sure your water is boiled before we do that and just in case uh if you need a recap of what uh happened in before we got cut off so right now we're brewing a style of tea called the yan cha or cliff tea rock tea these are the common translations uh, it is a style of oolong that's heavily uh, roasted and about mediumly fermented. So it's very different from the dance one we had yesterday, which is heavier fermentation and mediumly roasted. We already had the rinse of the tea, which carries most of the tea's aroma. And now we're going to do the first brew, where the tea will open up more and offer us a little bit more depth in its overall profile. And offer offers uh, also offers a fuller mouse feel as well. All right, we're going to smell the lid. So let's have a sip of this tea. Hmm. So one thing definitely you notice is that it has uh, increased uh, level of tannins, right? Uh, the taste seems to be much fuller, which ca also causes a longer lingering of the taste on our palate, right? It's no longer just uh, like skimming through it and then touch and go. Also, uh, it has a little bit of a metallic feeling as well. Um, this is actually a sweeter um, uh, yan cha in terms of uh, yan cha can be and I'll tell you in just a second why um, So remember the three factors that impact the taste of the tea is location Varietal and the processing so for cliff tea. Let's start talking about location The reason being this is actually now China's top tour and I would say out of all the tea regions in China Wishan right now is the most mature so the true origin or the uh, the the most the broadest uh, uh, con appellation control that you can get for a cliff tea is a uh, world heritage site called Wu Uh It's a beautiful formation. So if you uh, ever visit China, even if it's not for tea, I would highly recommend you pay a visit to the area. Um, not only the area is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so a lot of uh, both of the nature and the culture to explore, but also it's actually a um, uh, very mature tea region with a lot of great accommodations as well. So there are a lot of good activities, really, really cool, uh, uh, like a boutique hotels and the Airbnb uh, that has the owners all put a lot of thought into it. It's a beautiful area. And also uh, due to its relationship, uh, uh, be, both being a top tourist site within China and also uh, a, a hub for tea, it's uh, actually now attract a lot of uh, Chinese artists there. So just the, the human factor alone is amazing there as well. I highly recommend a visit to Wuyishan. But avoid some of the peak area because otherwise uh, it's going to be, be very, very busy. Of course, you do that when this, this whole coronavirus thing is cried down. All right. So um, Wuyishan, the t tour can be divided into... Uh, uh, three segments within the uh, True Cliff, uh, within the Wishan area. So you basically have your uh, True Cliff region, which is the top to war. And True Cliff region right now has seen four generations of development. Uh, depends on 
uh, when you are included in the true cliff region. So basically, if you're early on be included into the true cliff region, you are undistributedly the top top choice of a terroir. So that's uh, when you have certain uh, pedigree to go with it. Uh, but even the fourth generation, if it's true cliff, it's always uh, something that's worth showing off. And of course, it needs to be presented in the tea as well. When we taste the tea, that the the, um, the tea maker needs to be able to uh, show the toar in the tea. So. Um, so what is the true uh, cliff region? Long story short, if you are ever doubt, if you ever go to uh, the uh, Wishan area, um, if you had to pay the, the ticket to go into the UNESCO World Heritage Site, so everything within the area where you have to pay a ticket to go in, that is your true cliff region and everything outside of that is not the true cliff region basically um but just keep in mind the concept of true cliff is continue being developed um but in order for a place to be endorsed as top to war having very very rocky or cliffy kind of terrain is a uh it's it's a, it's a given it's a must you must have that kind of tour uh that kind of terrain in order to for you to be a top to war so um and outside of the true cliff region, you have the half cliff region, which is the area that's surrounding it. Uh, there are a few well-known villages as well. Uh, the teas in the half cliff region are all very, very aromatic, but does compromise a little bit on the mouthfeel. And then you also have the high mountain area. So the high mountain area is actually uh, an area that produced China's most well-known red teas, including the world's oldest red tea called uh, Zhengshan Xiaozhong, or more commonly known as Lapsun Sichuan in the West. But just keep in mind, I also never had a real Lapsun Sichuan. It's almost like the difference between you know champagne and sparkling wine. There are a lot of in-kind ones, but it's actually China's most exclusive tea region. You had to uh, go through checkpoints in order to go in. So uh, most of the Lapsun Sichuan I had here was just, uh, I don't know what they are. And the, uh, the region also produced a very new, a new style, but very expensive Chinese uh, red tea now called Jinjun Mei. So that's the high mountain area. And the high mountain area also produced some cliff tea, even though it's not their, uh, their main thing. Um, the high mountain area, the uh, uh, climate is very very cold and remember we're talking about when uh, during the brewing sessions when a, it is a really cold tea region the tea tends to have a higher clarity it's usually sweeter it's softer it has a mild temperament it's very long lasting in that mild temperament as well but it tends to not be very um, uh, very aggressive, uh, even though it can have some like a showy characters here and there. So this is actually a cliff tea that comes from the high mountain area. And this is one of the reasons makes it so drinkable uh, as a beginner cliff tea as well, is because uh, it's, it's just so sweet and so round and, and it's, uh, it's very gooey. I really love this tea. So uh, feel free to either finish the first brew or give it to a, uh, pour it into a separate cup so you can save it for later. Or of course you can drink all of them now. So let's brew the, uh, uh, heat the water again and then do it. So as with all teas, majority of the cliff tea or yan cha are actually not coming from uh, the Wishan area. They will come from the uh, the surrounding cities and townships. Um, so that's what you uh, usually see the, the dark roasted the oolong that people usually serve in restaurants uh, or like the bulk produced ones, those are from there. Uh, and those are just called field tea. Uh, or it's, uh, it's just a different tech, uh, terminology that we use for the plantation teas. Okay. So now let's try the second brew. And also the uh, standard brewing uh, size for uh, cliff tea or yan chai is uh, 8.3 grams. So that's the whole bag. And remember, if you are still feeling not confident with your brewing, uh, you can always use a lesser tea. So you're basically altering the water to tea ratio in order to uh, dilute a little bit to compensate what will be uh, prolonged in terms of time.
So what we're looking for a really good club tea um, is a, definitely a bright note uh, because it's much harder to make a dark color tea to be bright. Uh, there's also the minerality, the metallic that we're looking for in the good club tea. So in the, uh, if you go back and then visit our uh, video when I go through uh, the three different kinds of oolong just as a category, I drank one of my favorites, uh, which is a ro gui, which is a single varietal that comes from the Huiwen Kung. So that one, it definitely has a lot of it more of that. So for this particular one though, uh, what makes it so drinkable is that it's very, uh, it's very tender and uh, it's kind of sweet but yet it has a uh, very full roastiness because the leaves from the high mountain area is pretty thick uh, in order to uh, basically have almost like a defense system for the cold weather so it can take on a lot of the uh, the, the roast and that also makes the mouth feel very smooth and very gooey as well cool um, and next, let's talk about the cultivar variety a little bit. It is very common for oolong to use single cultivars to make the tea. So it's all, uh, and then the tea is named after that varietal. So for example, yesterday we had the baiye, and that is the, baiye is the name of that particular cultivar of tea tree that uh, the tea is harvested from, but also at the same time, it became the name for the tea. It's almost like you were making uh, a bottle of Chardonnay from the grape Chardonnay, and then the, you then call the wine Chardonnay, things like that. Uh, however, this is actually a blend. Now I want to point out in Chinese, we actually have two different words for blending with a plan, with intent, versus you're just like randomly mixing things together. This is very, very different from if you are uh, blending for, uh, like you're, if you're uh, flavoring the tea by blending tea with uh, other non-tea items, or if you are mixing a whole bunch of uh, different teas randomly together. The two words, uh, so I'm just gonna say here just in case we have any Chinese in front of the uh, camera. So we have um, uh, pinpei, which means, uh, so it literally means like piecing together and weighing and rationing out things. So uh, that is the word, as you probably can guess, uh, for uh, brewing, uh, sorry, for blending things in with intent. However, you also have another terminology called that doing, which means you're just kind of uh, taking things and mixing them together. Um, then usually if it's a, a, a blended that way, then it is considered more inferior. And that's oftentimes we use either with tea that is reprocessed, which is what flavored tea got classified in, is a reprocessed tea such as jasmine tea. Or uh, you can uh, do that with only tea, so no uh, non-tea items, but uh, it'll also just something to um, uh, to 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 increase a, a lot of tea. So basically, if you, somebody is asking for one ton of tea, which sometimes is that much, and you only have uh, uh, you know uh, uh, five hundred kilo of one and the uh, another tea, so then you put them together, and then all of a sudden you have one ton of tea. So things uh, for to accommodate those kind of needs, that's when you da do the tea, which is very different to us. Uh, uh, two styles of blending that you will apply to the tea. Um, so here, when we say we blend the tea, it's very similar to when you have a blended wine, where you're basically using different cultivars, different varietals of the tea trees uh, to achieve this blend. Um, so there are many different uh, do's and don't do's with blending the tea, and that's a different topic. And a lot of the uh, uh, experienced tea maker, they will have their own theories and don't their own go abouts as well. So um, now let's talk a little bit about processing. And um, with the processing, you notice the uh, there's a uh, different thing that we need to do for the blending. So for oolong, once again, you're only going to pick a uh, fully opened tea leaf. So it's the leaves only, no buds. Uh, where it's dense home, you pick a more tender, small to medium opening tea leaves. For cleft tea or yan cha, you're picking the tea leaves that's a little bit more mature, so it's medium to large openings, and the tea leaves are already pretty frontal, and then it has a little bit of maturity level as well. You, you still want to pick a long stem, and this is how you're going to maintain the water feed to the tea. And once the tea is harvested, 
uh, you do want to, uh, if, if possible, to sample the tea a little bit. Uh, right now, I have to say in the Kofti region, because of the very high demand and the, the uh, moving into more standardized processing um, methods, so what you're going to see is uh, people usually put the tea into this machine they call it the comprehensive tea making machine. So it's a uh, further development from the barrel that people use to roll the, uh, to shake and roll the tea in, or sort of flip the tea in, so not rolling like this, to just like uh, tumble the tea in. So what they're going to have now is this machine actually have the ability to introduce heat and introduce wind. So with the heat, sometimes people are using that to mimic the sun uh, wilting process. And um, also uh, this machine will allow people to not having to take the tea leaves out to do the uh, shade wilting, which traditionally after you put the tea leaves under the sun for, and this really varies to depends on how strong the sun is, can be 15 minutes, can be three, four hours, and then you take the tea inside and then uh, to let the tea continue to wilt under shade. So with this machine, you can just leave the tea in the machine. But regardless, it's all means to achieve end. So um, these are all very necessary steps to prepare the tea before we can start shaking the tea. Um, the standard, the signature shaking step in making a oolong usually comes around after uh, around dinner, after dinner time. Uh, depends on the weather and how soon the tea leaves come back. Uh, it can be 8 p.m., it can be 10 p.m., uh, but then you start shaking the tea. And remember, shaking the tea is to repel any of the undesired aroma out of the tea leaves. The tea will smell very, very strong when you're shaking the tea leaves. And to also help the water molecule that carries uh, compounds that does not exist in the leaves or is lacking in the tea leaves to into the tea leaves. So this helps to maintain a water feed, but also to increase the complexity of the making of the tea. Um, and during this process, the tea will uh, transform in its aroma many, many different ways. Um, it takes an experienced tea maker to know when to shake the tea, when to stop shaking the tea, and also what is desired aroma. And that's why I keep emphasizing on this idea of the aesthetic of taste. So, uh, for example, you know, with fine art, you kind of need to train your eyes, uh, maybe the more you look at it or you go through some uh, 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 structural education that you know how to uh, identify very sophisticated and fine art among all the others. And the same thing with training your ears for music, the same thing we're training our uh, uh, olfactory senses to identify what is the desired aroma throughout this making process where the tea is going to smell very very strong and also you know as we're tasting the tea this is how you slowly will train to identify a uh, certain desired taste and then some of the taste that's not desired. Um, for club tea, because the tea leaves are a little bit more mature, you do want to shake the tea uh, a little bit more frequently and um, so with a shorter time intervals. So uh, for cleft tea, you're looking at about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so that's the waiting time in between the shaking. So you want to shake the tea every 45 minutes to an hour, and you can do this about uh, seven times a night. Uh, it really depends. You know, you have to look at the leaves to make the tea. Uh, these are all means to end. So uh, depends on the techniques that the tea maker wants to utilize. This is how you do it. And now we're looking at about 3 a.m. again. Uh, and that's the time that tea makers get to take a uh, small nap um, and the tea will continue to ferment once it has achieved the uh, status the tea maker wants for the tea to just rest there. And then after that, what the tea maker uh, is going to do is you need to get up around uh, 6, 7, or 8 a.m., depends on where you leave the tea at. And this is when we apply the kill green step. You kill the enzymes in the tea to freeze the tea at this particular right. state. So let me now uh, boil the water again to brew the next brew, which is the third brew of this tea. So if you're at home, feel free to boil the water again also, and then you can brew the tea with me. Okay. So I was talking about the kill green step where you apply high heat to the tea leaves to destroy all the enzymes in the tea. And then after that, what you want to do is to roll the tea while the tea is still a little bit warm and is more malleable. Uh, so this is what we how we achieve the string shape of the tea. 
And after you have done that, then the tea needs to be baked dry. This is once again, you want to do it two to three times because remember this is more mature leaves in order to make sure the tea is thoroughly dried. And let's try the third brew. Mm. The oozy note comes through a little bit more. It also has a little bit of a minerality to it, even though it's not as mineral as some of the other um, true cliff teas that you're uh, going to experience with. All right. And after this, uh, what we... Uh, Uh, so after the uh, uh, baking, uh, the tea dry is achieved, what you want to do is remember we're going to spend the whole summer sorting the tea. And this is extra long for uh, making cliff tea. So because the Wishan region is colder, uh, the harvesting season for true cliff tea is not until May. So May 1st to May 15th are usually the date you want to put aside if you want to visit Wishan in, uh, during tea harvesting season. Uh, this whole summer will be spent sorting out the stems and the leaves. Uh, the first deadline the tea makers are usually aiming to have the first rounds of finished root tea uh, to be presented to the market is usually the Moon Festival of China, which is every year it's uh, August 15th for the lunar calendar. So what it is, is a, around uh, September or October time, depends on the year. So that's usually the deadline the tea makers are uh, looking at. Remember. Um, every time you roast the tea, you want to wait for three weeks before you can have the tea in the market or before you roast the tea again. When we roast the cliff tea, um, uh, each roasting period takes a little bit longer. It'll be about 8 to 12 hours, depends on uh, what tea you're roasting. And in some of the varietal, if it's a larger leaf, you want to do it for uh, even longer time. And uh, then you take the tea off the roast and you let the tea rest for about three weeks. And then you can roast the tea again. Two times would be minimum. Many teas will require three times. If you're blending, you're looking at much longer than three times because what needs to happen is that you have to pre-roast each individual ingredient. So when you're ma making the tea pre-roasting, you already have in mind that this is a tea that needs to be going into the blend. So uh, what you want to do is you roast the tea so they all be at the same level. That's when you can mix the tea together. So you can blend the tea and then they can go through one or two additional rounds of roastings together. But because different varietal will catch the roast at different levels. So you have to prepare them so they're all at this one line that they can finish at the same time after the final roast. I hope this makes sense. So basically you've got to prepare all your tea before the final roasting of the blend. And um, the second deadline the tea makers are aiming for, and this is usually where the better tea comes out, which is the tea competition in mid-November. Um, for uh, the Moon Festival every year, uh, which goes with the lunar calendar, uh, this is a good opportunity for people to gift tea um, and a lot of corporate giftings. So it's usually the larger batches of the teas. However, for tea competition, that's when the tea connoisseurs are looking for a better tea and that people usually will reserve the better teas that they can sell for a higher price for that period of time. Um, and just keep in mind, you have to let the tea rest for three weeks before drinking it. So you always counting the date and then give it three weeks and you know that's when the final roast needs to be ready. All right, so I finished the location, the varietal, and the processing. And now let's talk about the name of this tea, which is called Da Hong Hao. It's probably one of China's most well-known tea names, which means great red robe or big red robe, depends on uh, which way of translation you want to go with. Um, on our Instagram earlier today, you will actually see a video of me in Wishan uh, pointing at the uh, Da Hong Pao tea trees. Now, uh, there's so many myths around the tea tree. I would highly suggest you also go on our YouTube channel to find the interview I had with uh, the head monk of the temple where these tea trees are literally in their backyard. So 
Uh, however, I just want to say that Da Hong Pao is actually a bland. Even the original tea trees, which are so many rumors around them. By the way, uh, actually, it's not until the 1930s uh, that uh, these tea trees start to be associated with the name Da Hong Pao, uh, or the name Da Hong Pao start to be associated with the tea tree. So the history was not that ancient, actually. And uh, they're of different cultivars. So it's a natural blend. It is all heirloom. So it is not from a single cultivar anyway. So Da Hong Pao is basically the name of a blended cliff tea. Uh, so if a, somebody say this is a Da Hong Pao, uh, you should assume that it is a blend of multiple cultivars of the cliff tea varietals. And, um, but also keep in mind, because the region is a tourist attraction, there are also a lot of people getting, Chinese people getting very confused and they think Da Hong Pao is just either synonymous with uh, cliff tea or they still think that people harvesting from the original tea trees or harvesting from what they call the second generation of the tea trees, which is not such thing. There's no such thing as second generation of the, uh, the Da Hong Pao trees. However, blending Da Hong Pao is actually quite a sophisticated tea making art. During the tea competition, uh, there are actually three regular categories, which is Rou Gui Shui Xian, which are the two single cultivars that's most commonly found in the True Cliff region. And then you have the Da Hong Pao, which is a category for blending. And then you have a category called Other, which sometimes uh, host, but sometimes it's a, it's a category that's a, a limited in certain years. So just keep in mind, blending the cup tea is quite a thing, and it's probably China's most famous the most well-known blend and uh, if you have a master team maker definitely pick the, their brain to get their uh, theory their uh, experience on blending the tea it takes a very uh, experienced team maker to be able to blend the tea all right so now let's go into question and thank you so much for bearing with me uh, just keep in mind when you're brewing the uh, last brew uh, the last several brews of this tea at home, uh, you definitely want to keep brewing it until you feel the tea is more exhausted. And this tea can last also uh, 8 to 10 brews very easily, it depends on how well you manage the earlier brews. And then feel free to let the tea sit for a really long time in the last brew. And this is how you're going to uh, uh, have the, uh, the fully find out, you know, what is left in the tea. Can you explain the fermentation part a little bit? I'm very confused about oxidation and fermentation. Just keep in mind, neither word is very uh, accurate in describing the unique and complicated uh, metabolism that happens in the tea during the making. That what makes tea tea, right? Um, it's really their characteristic metabolism. However, oxidation um, is only referring to the uh, the enzymes, the, these oxidative enzymes. Um, uh, oxidizing the uh, the cartilages in tea, which is part of what happens during tea making, but it's not comprehensive enough to describe it. Um, the uh, oxidation is also a more strict term to describe the exact things that happens versus fermentation is a slightly looser term. And so we, we use the term fermentation because it's more comprehensively describing what happens during the uh, process in making tea. Sometimes when you uh, read certain uh, tea literature you'll see people talking about how to make green tea you kill the enzymes which are the oxidative enzymes and that stops the tea from fermentation from oxidation and if we're making oolong you chop the tea up expose the tea to the air let the tea leaves oxidize and uh, and then this is what you get your oolong and then for black tea you do the same thing and you let the tea uh, exposed to the air for a longer period of time for it to completely oxidize this is how it gives you black tea now this is the difference this is why the confusion because if you only make tea that way yes that's all that have happened however for making uh, truly artisanal tea this is just too simple that's not how you uh, you, you actually make uh, fine tea uh, so the, the what happens during the tea making is very complicated and there are many different uh, chemical reactions that can happen and that process altogether we are comprehensively calling it fermentation to bring it a little bit closer to accuracy 
Uh, even though it's still not fully accurate either. Now, um, so basically, uh, I was talking about how you pick the tea leaves. As soon as you pick it, and the oxygen goes in, and that sends a signal to these enzymes, and it'll start to kick off a chain reaction that can happen in the tea leaves that results in such a dynamic taste you later will experience in the tea. So uh, this chain reaction um, is, is basically, uh, in the full picture of the chemical exchanges, this is what you cannot just simply use the term oxidation to fully describe what happens. Yeah, but I can see the the uh, the, the the confusion because there are teas um, to. To be honest, for me, when I look at how those teas are made, I'm going to assume it's almost like a, a winemaker looking at someone who uh, only strained the must and let it ferment for a week and there's a little bit alcoholic and start calling it wine. Um, there's a big difference for uh, making fine wine and making wine that way. Same thing, there's a big difference between making tea just by exposing tea to air versus uh, um, you know all those uh, sophisticated steps that you had to take uh, and the delicacies, deli how to delicately handle the tea, those kind of things. All right. So there was a question about uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, heirloom tea trees and also can heirloom be a hybrid? Um, yes and no. So um, when we say heirloom tea trees, and which is the academic term is a group of varieties, right? So because it's a, a um, it's a uh, uh, not a single cultivar. So uh, because of that, um, if the tea tree, if you take two heirloom varietals and you crossbreed them, then you'll have a hybrid. But um, depends on are you going to then uh, let this hybrid reproduce, and which will happen, right? So it'll basically be human trying to interfere what nature will do. So right, let's just assume in uh, there's a chance in nature these two teachers will also automatically marry each other and then give us an offspring. But now we're just using human interference to let that happen. But that seed will give us a baby tea tree that's not going to be the same with either tea trees, right? So just like how we uh, humans, every even though we are um, uh, we are similar to our parents, but we are never going to be exactly the same with our parents and we're never the same with our siblings either. So for heirloom tea trees, it's actually exactly that. Uh, if you reproduce the tea with um, uh, a seed pocket, then uh, it'll never be stabilized. Um, so in order to have it stabilized, then you had to take the saplings and once you clone it, uh, you can't really call it an heirloom anymore. So that's basically uh, what it is. I hope I explained that good. And I think before we get cut off, maybe we can uh, squeeze in another uh, question. But if there's no more questions, I guess we'll finally put an end to this uh, frustrating uh, technical struggles. And thank you so much for bearing with me. Uh, we're going to have a, um, uh, uh, we're going to taste a red tea tomorrow. Um, so let's get ready for that and hope we have better um, uh, clones. Um, well. It depends, you know, for uh, Oolong, is you're mostly dealing with clones because you're looking at the signature uh, aromas and characteristics of a single tea tree. So it really depends on your objectives. But if you're looking for complexity, of course, heirloom always offers us the greatest complexity. But it is very difficult to uh, make uh, a mixture of different varietals. It's almost like a chef trying to cook ingredients all cut into different sizes. So it depends on what we are looking for. Um, so oolong doesn't really age, um, and uh, I would say you want to drink your oolong probably uh, like. I'll give it like five years for oolong to uh, maintain its aroma. If it's a very cool and dry area like um, uh, New York, maybe seven years. Uh, but in general, oolongs, uh, as the oolong gets older, uh, you start to compromise on the aroma a little bit. Uh, it'll become earthier, but it does not age to become complex. So that's why we do not consider an aging process. It's just becoming earthier and earthier. Um, it is recommended to uh, drink the oolong the year after it's harvested um, and it's just it tastes better all the taste start all the uh, tasting will start to consolidate better and it gives it a sense of concentration and clarity all right 
Okay, thank you so much, everyone. You guys are all amazing for bearing with me with the multiple cutoffs. And uh, uh, you can also uh, just let us know if you have questions when you, um, uh, uh, you know, see them on the post and you can comment there or send us email, either way works. Is that true for all oolong? Can oolong be processed to age better? No, because uh, aging uh, is based on whether or not the enzyme is either uh, exhausted or killed. So any tea that goes through a deliberate uh, kill green process so basically you deliberately enjoying all the ends uh, destroying all the enzymes in tea such as oolong you cannot do that i've seen people in the west hosting tea competition it was like a some like 25 year old tea guan win the competition i was like you know it's really almost the equivalent of you have a wine competition and a uh extremely sour or corked peanut gradual of 25 year old uh win the competition it's a little bizarre yeah all right. Okay. Thank you so much.